Yeah, make sure we're recording this time. All right, good. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Hiller Hanger Talk. Our guest tonight is going to be Brian DiGiorgio with his talk, Ask an Astronomer. But before we begin, we just have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, I'm going to see if I can keep my eye on the waiting room. Let me make sure I can see that. Sorry. It's always annoying when you're in a Zoom talk and the presenter is talking to themselves. Okay. So again, as a little piece of Zoom etiquette, we'll keep everybody muted. If you've got questions that are burning a hole in your brain during the talk, the best thing to do is to write them into the chat. So we're going to keep an eye on the chat. And at the bottom of the hour, when Brian is sort of wrapping up his talk, he'll be able to do Q&A and we'll be able to read off of the chat. So that's the best way, way to do the questions. So make sure you can find your chat, which is on your Zoom controls at the bottom there. It says chat and you can open that up and we'll keep an eye on the chat and get to questions and answers as we get to the end of the talk. So what's going on? We have, of course, information. You can always find out about the museum at www.hiller.org. We are not open at the moment. Uh, the last time we met, we had just reopened, but the state of California has kind of backed off on the reopening schedule and now we're back to being closed again. So that's an unfortunate. We're not sure when that will resolve itself, but at the moment we're not open physically, but we do have our offerings that you can take advantage of online on our Hiller at Home page. Different activities, take home and, and make uh, projects that you can do at home, including uh, virtual tours and we have videos and other interesting things you can take a look at, NASA simulations and so forth. And we have our virtual invention lab, which we host every Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m. And we do different make and take activities live on Zoom with a instructor to help facilitate with the making, the cutting and the pasting and so forth. So it's great for kids great for adults to do with your kids. And you just need to go to our virtual invention lab page and there's a, a Zoom link on it. You can just go right into it. It doesn't require any pre-registering or anything. Just show up uh, to this page uh, on Wednesday, Saturday, or Sunday at one o'clock. So the next one coming up would be this Saturday at one o'clock. We're gonna be making an Apollo command module uh, that you can see right there. That's kind of cool. We also, of course, have our Hiller Hanger Talks. And the one coming up two weeks from now will be on the subject of the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen. We actually have a freshly completed replica of the Fokker DR1 triplane that he flew famously in our museum gallery. And I wish you could come in and see it. Uh, we were open there for at least a little while and you were able to see it when we reopen again uh, during this pandemic business. Uh, you'll be able to, to take a look at the Red Baron replica in our gallery, but we have an interesting talk by a gentleman who's an aviation history researcher, J.R. Williams, and he'll be doing his talk on the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, at the end of the month, two weeks from today, on July 29th at 7 o'clock. So again, you can get all of this information on our website at www.hiller.org. So with that out of the way, I would like to introduce our guest for tonight with an interesting talk Ask an astronomer, and he'll tell us a little bit about himself. So please uh, welcome with me, Brian DiGiorgio. You'll have to unmute, Brian. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, um, as Jeff was saying, I'm Brian DiGiorgio. And so today I'm going to talk to you about what it's like being the on call astronomer for the state of California and for the entire internet. Um, so there's going to be a lot of questions in this uh, talk and you know that's kind of the whole point of the talk is for you to be able to ask questions but um, if you can put those questions in the chat then that'll be good and I'll get to them at the end. Um, but we'll start off with a basic question. Who am I? 
Um, so I am a third year PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm originally from San Carlos and I have a connection to Hiller. I volunteered there and got my private pilot's, lessons, private pilot's license at uh, San Carlos Airport when I was in high school. Um, but nowadays my day job is writing a lot of computer code to analyze galaxy rotation and gravitational lensing on various data sets from various different telescopes around uh, the world. And so, but by night, my alter ego job is being the Ask an Astronomer uh, representative for UC observatories. Uh, so what is UC observatories? It's the overarching administrative body for all of the University of California's telescopes and observatories. This includes a few things. It includes the uh, Lick Observatory on top of Mount Hamilton. They have various telescopes there that have been built there over the past 125 years or so. Um, it includes the Keck telescopes on top of the volcano in Hawaii, um, which are currently the biggest telescopes that are in service in the world. And it also includes the upcoming 30 meter telescope, which uh, if it ever gets built, it's hit some bumps in the road. Um, that will also be the largest telescope in the world. Um, so the reason that the, all of this is important, what UC Observatories is, is because it is uh, headquartered right here with me at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, of course, the Santa Cruz banana slugs are very proud of themselves, and this is our uh, astronomy slug that we have. So having all of this headquartered here means that we get a lot of uh, astronomy opportunities and resources it, here at Santa Cruz, and one of which that is far, far down the list in terms of the grand scheme of importance to the department is the Ask an Astronomer website. So this is a website slash email address that is run through UC observatories that will try to answer whatever questions come our way. Anybody who sends an email to askanastronomer at uculick.org uh, will have their question distributed out to me and the other grad students that uh, man the email address. And then we will send you back an answer to the best of our ability and uh, put the website or put the answer up on the website afterwards. And this is a view of what the website looks like. It's currently undergoing renovation. So hopefully we can replace it with something a little bit more modern pretty soon. But that also kind of got messed up by pandemic things. Um, so what I want to talk about in this talk is what kind of people ask these questions and what kind of things are they asking? What is the typical person who sends a question to a random astronomer on the internet? What are they actually looking for? And by far, I would say the most common type of question that we get is someone who was standing outside looking at the sky like this and sees some bright flash in the sky or some object that they don't recognize and they ask, what is that thing that I just saw in the sky? And we get all sorts of uh, variations on this question. And that is, uh, so in order to kind of organize what all of these questions look like, I have made this handy flowchart, um, And it helps to break down all of the different things that uh, people ask when they uh, send an email to us. So the first question that we ask is, or that I ask myself is, is it, moving. Usually someone will say like, oh, it was just like something stationary or it was moving across the sky. And then is it permanent? Like, was it lasting or was it just temporary? Um, so we're going to kind of step through all of these different cases and talk about what sorts of things people ask about um, and the kinds of uh, responses that I give to them. So starting with number one down here, things that are moving but permanent. Um, a typical question like this is, uh, last night I've seen a mysterious object in space when I was walking in my backyard. I was gazing at the stars and at that moment, suddenly a very fast moving object was seen by my eyes. It looks as, it's as small as we look stars with our naked eyes, but it's moving very fast. I don't know, what was it? Um, and when I read a question like this, usually my first thought is, well, it was probably a satellite. Um, so most of you probably know that 
overhead in space at any time. There are a bunch of satellites that are all orbiting around uh, the Earth. But what not everybody knows is that you can actually see those satellites under the right conditions. So here's a uh, animation of this giant cloud of thousands and thousands of satellites that are overhead. And you can see some of them are kind of far away in this like diffuse outer ring. But if we zoom in close, there's this uh, inner shell of satellites that are in what's called low Earth orbit. And these satellites are frequently uh, bright enough for you to see in the naked eye. And you can see that over a given point on the ground, there are usually some satellites that uh, are going by at any time. So if you're standing outside um, not too long after sunset, when the satellites overhead are still kind of in the sunlight, then you should be able to see uh, the satellites passing overhead looking just like a normal star would um, to the naked eye. Um, of course, there are also special cases for these questions. So here's somebody who asked, I see lots of objects moving across the sky above our atmosphere at high steady speed, hundreds of them. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, and what this person saw was probably something like what is illustrated in this video right here, which is the uh, Starlink satellite constellation. Um, again, some of you may have heard about this in the news recently, but SpaceX, uh, the private rocket company, is launching up uh, hundreds of small satellites for transmitting internet down from space um, that will be accessible from anywhere on the Earth, which is great in terms of uh, getting internet to rural areas or uh, places that don't have fast internet. Um, but in order to have enough coverage, they need thousands of satellites going swarming over the Earth at any time. And they launch these 60 at a time in one big clump. And as they are spreading themselves out across the sky, you can see them march across the sky in these uh, very bright and distinct lines if you're looking at the right place in the right time. So what this person probably saw, uh, a bunch of dots moving across the sky in one steady line, was probably a recent launch of uh, these Starlink satellites uh, passing overhead. So these satellites sound great for internet accessibility, but they may not be great for astronomers. Um, Here's a picture that was taken recently from a telescope in uh, the Southern Hemisphere in Chile uh, called the, it, it, as part of a uh, telescope survey called the Dark Energy Survey. You can see that scattered around in these different pictures that are all kind of stitched together, there are a bunch of little white dots. Those are all stars and galaxies. Um, that's what the satellite or the uh, telescope was trying to look for. But you can see these big diagonal white slashes that are going across the field. Um, those are Starlink satellites. This telescope happened to be looking exactly where those satellites were passing in front of it. And uh, then it, its view was completely polluted by these satellites that were going by. So this is something that astronomers are very afraid of because eventually there will be thousands of these satellites going overhead and at any given time you may see a few of them in a wide telescope field like this. So astronomers are currently working with SpaceX to figure out a way that these uh, satellites will not ruin astronomy pictures as we know them. Um, well, so back to our flowchart, we can move on to the next branch of our uh, decision tree. So things that are moving but not permanent. So an example question of these would be something like, I saw a star or star-like thing. It was very bright, it was moving, it flashed and once and then vanished. And then after a few seconds, it appeared at some other place, flashed and vanished. Uh, it repeated this several times until it got out of sight. So what is this thing? And after thinking about this, you know, reading all the information that they sent me in email, I, what I responded to this person was that it was probably tumbling space debris um, from a past rocket launch. So I was showing earlier that animation of all of the satellites that are uh, passing over the Earth at any given time. Uh, a lot of these objects are things like weather satellites or communication satellites or GPS satellites, things that people meant to put there. But every once in a while you have 
some leftover garbage like uh, a spent rocket stage or a satellite that broke and is out of control and it will just be kind of slowly tumbling over itself um, and not really staying in the same place. And under the right conditions, if you look at one of these things, it will look like this video where you can see this white dot that is making its way across the picture here. It gets dimmer and then it will get brighter and then it will dim again and then every few seconds as this thing is rotating around, it will get brighter, get dimmer and uh, affect what you're seeing. And this is because like, you know, if it's something like a rocket stage, usually rocket fuel tanks are these long white cylinders. And if it's rotating, then sometimes you'll be looking at the broad side of the, uh, the rocket stage and it'll look really bright. And sometimes you'll be looking at the end of the rocket stage and it'll look really small and not as bright. And so as these things are rotating relative to you, it'll be getting brighter and then dimmer and then brighter and then dimmer. And so uh, depending on how bright the thing was in the first place, sometimes it will look like it flashes in one place and then disappears and flashes in another place. Um, so these things can oftentimes confuse people. I just got another one of these questions uh, a, a couple of days ago that I still have to answer. Um, so a special case of these kinds of um, moving but not permanent objects are something called iridium flares. Um, and this is something that I first discovered for myself when I was in middle school. Um, my middle school science teacher had a uh, assignment for us to go out and look at the stars for 15 minutes every night and see what we saw. And one night I saw a super, super bright flash that appeared in the sky and then it was just gone. And um, I eventually discovered that, well, and so this is kind of an illustration, this picture of what it looks like. It's a satellite or it's something that is moving along and then gets really bright and then just fades away back into nothing. Um, and so what these are, are these satellites that were made by a company called Iridium, which is actually a satellite phone company. And they, uh, if we were to zoom way, way in on this picture, they look something like this. Um, you can see there's the satellite down here and it has these giant reflector panels on top to beam your uh, satellite phone conversations all across the planet. So if the sun, reflects off of one of these reflector panels um, as it's doing in this picture right here, it will create this really, really bright glare um, for people that are kind of standing at exactly the right angle. So if you were to look at the reflection of the sun in this satellite, then it would, you know, as it gets perfectly aligned, it would get really, really bright. But then as the sun moves away, it would uh, just dim and fade away into nothing. Um, and there used to be a, or like these satellites used to be on very predictable orbits. So you could go to a website and find out exactly where this satellite was going to be and then where it was going to flare and then go out and you could set your watch by how precisely these satellites would uh, brighten. But sadly, at least for amateur astronomers, uh, these uh, satellites are being decommissioned because the Iridium company has newer, better satellites that don't need these giant uh, reflector panels. So there, you can still see flares like this every once in a while as a uh, random satellite will catch your eye, um, but they're not as predictable anymore. Um, so moving on to the other side of our dishes and tree here, um, things that are not moving, but permanent. Um, this can be, of course, all sorts of things, but here's an example of uh, one question that I got. Tonight, my wife, my son, and I witnessed a crescent-shaped lit object in the evening sky that was not the moon. This initially looked like a bright planet near sunset that seemed a little off in shape. When we viewed it through binoculars and we, imme we and immediately could see that it was crescent-shaped. Obviously, there should be nothing crescent-shaped in the sky other than the moon. Um, to which I responded, well, that sounds like Venus. Um, a lot of people, obviously, just like this person, think that the moon is the only thing that really has phases, but really all of the planets have phases. Um, all of the planets are moving around the sun in the same way that the Earth is, which means that sometimes you'll see the bright part and sometimes you'll see the dark part, but most of the time you're just going to see some mixture of bright and dark. Just like we're seeing on the moon, you can see 
uh, part of the part that is lit up by the sun and part of the part that is in the uh, that where the sun has set on the moon, the same thing can be true of Venus. So here's a really cool uh, montage of Venus, uh, pictures of Venus as it goes around the sun. You can see that it starts off kind of like, you know, a half moon shape, a half Venus phase. And then as we see more and more of the dark side of Venus, um, it looks more and more like a crescent and eventually we won't be able to see it anymore because it will only be looking at the night side of the crescent. So what this person probably saw low in the sky in the evening was Venus as it was close to the sun, um, only having a little bit of its surface to, that is facing us being lit up by the sun. Um, so you can see it, it will look like a crescent. Um, so for these kinds of objects that are you know, permanent fixtures in the sky. I always recommend uh, people to use this amazing piece of software called Stellarium. You can do something like look for Venus and then zoom all the way in and you can see, oh look, it's a crescent and it's just above the sun right where I saw it last night. And if you wanted to kind of explore the sky on your own, then you can, you know, zoom all the way out and look around wherever you want and look at all the constellations and objects that are in the sky and see whatever you wanted to see or look for whatever you had just seen in the past. So whenever somebody asks me a question like this, this is what I always recommend. Um, and I would recommend it to all of you. It's fun to just wander around aimlessly and see what you can find in the sky. Um, so uh, a special case of this that I encountered was a very interesting question that somebody asked me. Tonight, I was taking some pictures of the moon and Venus and my little brother shouted that he sees a bright white star. The thing was moving barely at all, as slowly as the sky moved. And a few seconds after that happened, the object faded and then it returned quickly as two bright dots. So I had to think a lot about this one, about what this could possibly be. And after doing some research, I determined that it might have been a geostationary satellite. So going back to that animation of uh, satellites that I was showing earlier, before we were focusing on the satellites in the inner ring, the low Earth orbit satellites at the center. But if you look on the outer part of this animation, then, oh, geez, uh, then you can see uh, that there are a whole bunch of satellites in this outer part of the, uh, uh, like much further away from the Earth. And these are what are called geostationary satellites. And these are, satellites are in an orbit that takes exactly 24 hours for them to go all the way around the Earth, which means that if you launch an orbit, or if you launch a satellite into orbit directly above you in North America here, then it will continuously uh, go around, or it will orbit in 24 hours, just like the Earth rotates in 24 hours, and it will stay directly above you the entire time. And this is useful if you're, you know, like direct TV or something like that, and you are running a satellite TV company for the United States. You don't want your uh, satellite to be over Africa half the time, because that doesn't make you any money. You just want it to be over uh, the United States all the time. Um, so under very specific conditions, you can still see these satellites. These satellites are a lot dimmer uh, because they're so much further away. But if you get in a position where they can have like one of those mini iridium flares um, where the sun is reflecting off their solar panels, you can see uh, them for a short amount of time. So in this video here, you'll notice the stars are kind of moving along through the sky as stars do, but there's this line of little white dots that are staying stationary relative to the sky, ge geostationary satellites, and flaring up quickly and then going back, in, or back into darkness as they catch the sun and then the sun moves away. Um, so this can only happen at certain times of year when the alignment of these satellites is perfect. And this person, I think, happened to be looking at the right time of year in the right place and happened to see a few of these satellites kind of slowly appearing and disappearing through the sky. So that was cool for me. That was something that I didn't know you could see until I did some research on what this person could have seen. Um, on to our last branch of the decision tree here, things that are not moving and not permanent. And this is, I would say, the hardest branch to answer, but also the most common branch. 
So usually a typical question that I get in this branch is something like this. I saw a little circle flash of blue white light. It lasted less than a second and disappeared uh, like a distant camera's flash. I was wondering if this could be a supernova. Um, and the answer that I usually give to these questions are, well, it depends. This could have been a lot of things. But one thing I do know is it's not a supernova. Um, so in case you don't know, uh, a supernova is a giant star that dies in a massive explosion that is so bright it can uh, outshine an entire galaxy. So if you added together all of the light from all of the stars in our galaxy, this one exploding star uh, would be brighter than all of them put together. Um, and this explosion happens over the course of a few days and then it gets reaches its peak brightness and then it will dim over the course of months or even years. Uh, as it kind of fades away into nothing. Um, the last supernova that was visible to the naked eye was in 1987. I have a picture of the remnant of the supernova here. Um, it was uh, this star at the center right here that exploded and you can see the jets of material that are these like circles that came out of it that are you know slowly spreading outwards from the uh, supernova. So since these supernovas are so rare, the last one that we saw with our, like that was close enough for us to see with the naked eye was in 1987, any new close supernova that happened would be a huge deal in astronomy. I'm saying like, you know, people would be talking about this thing for decades. There are so many theories that people have about stars and supernovas and things, and all they need is one supernova to test this theory, but we haven't been able to uh, find any that are close enough for us to really study it in detail. We see them in other galaxies all the time, but they're too far away for us to really uh, study well. So if it was that big of news, then the thing that you saw uh, in your backyard was probably not this astronomy changing event that everyone's been waiting hundreds of years for. And most of these people say that their objects look like uh, a camera flash and re in reality these things get brighter over the course of days and then fade over the course of months or years so it's uh that doesn't really fit the observations that people give so if it's not a supernova then what is it um this is a question without a very satisfying answer it might have been a mini iridium flare like i said all, any satellite that kind of catches the sunlight briefly with one of its solar panels or reflectors um, can cause a little bright flash of light and then go away quickly. And if it happens fast enough, then you might not uh, see that it's moving like a satellite is. Um, or it could be cosmic radiation in your eye. Um, we're constantly being bombarded with particles from uh, space that are totally harmless, but are kind of passing through us and our bodies all the time. And if one passes through your eye in the dark, then sometimes you can see the little flash of light that it gives off when it goes through uh, your eye. And again, this is harmless, but uh, it is happening constantly. Like here's a video feed from the space station and you can see all of these like little dots of static are from uh, the cosmic radiation that is kind of passing through the camera here. Um, and the last option that's kind of the most underwhelming is maybe it was just your brain making it up. Uh, the human eye is really good at seeing things. And so if you're standing in the dark and you're not seeing anything, then sometimes your eye just gets bored and makes something up. And it's kind of a uh, boring and underwhelming answer to give to somebody, but you know, the brain pr plays tricks on us all the time and oftentimes making little flashes in the corner of your eye are uh, one of them if your brain is bored. So um, moving on from that flowchart, some of the other kinds of questions I get are, uh, they seem kind of random and mundane, but they end up being super interesting and send me down a whole rabbit hole of research. So here's an example of one of those. Um, somebody who is having an argument with her co-workers. Um, I know that the days of the week relate to the planets, the sun, moon, Mars, Jupiter, blah, 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 in that order. I understand that the Greeks and the Romans and the Norse and the Germanic tribes all have roots in this, but what's not clear to anyone is why are these days of the week in the order that they are? It's not their placement in the solar system and it's not their distance from the earth. So, you know, what is it? 
And I, after doing a bunch of research on this, I responded back, buckle up, this one's really complicated. So to start to answer this question, first we have to go back uh, more than 2000 years to ancient Greece and the ancient philosopher Ptolemy who uh, came up with this model for the solar system. Uh, so you'll notice that there are a few things that are different about this model of the solar system compared to the model of the solar system that we know now. Uh, the first most obvious one is that the Earth is at the middle instead of the sun. Of course, uh, it was not widely accepted in science until the 1500s that the Earth was not the center of the solar system. Um, the second thing you'll notice is that there aren't as many planets as uh, in our current understanding of the solar system. There's no Uranus or Neptune out uh, past Saturn. Um, and the third thing you'll notice is that some of these planets aren't really what we would call planets. One of them is the moon and one of them is the sun. Um, so the question is how did Ptolemy and the ancient Greek astronomers end up with this model for their solar system? And they, so what they did to put everything in this order was they said, okay, we're just gonna sort everything by how fast it moves through the sky. So the moon gets to be the innermost planet because it is moving around the sky the fastest. It only takes one month for the moon to go to complete a full cycle through the sky, so that must mean it's the closest, according to the Greeks. Um, they were right about that one, but you know, wrong reasons. Um, and then you can go out to Mercury, which takes about you know three months to go all the way around the sun, and then Venus, and of course out to the sun. Uh, we have uh, that takes one year to complete one full cycle. Um, and then the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn take longer than that. So they kind of, you know, got to almost the right place um, just by looking at all of these planets from slowest to fastest as they move through the sky. Um, and they gave them all these fun symbols too, so that's useful. Um, so now if we have this table of uh, planets ranging from slowest to fastest, uh, in terms of how they move through the sky. Then uh, the next step that these Greek philosophers took was, you know, this astrology thing seems pretty cool, but I don't think it's detailed enough yet. What if we took every hour of every day and assigned it to one of these planets? And so that's what they did. They made this giant table of all of the hours in all of the days and assigned each one to each planet. So they started with, on the first day, the slowest uh, planet, which is Saturn, and then they went to Jupiter, and then Mars and the Sun, and blah, 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 all the way on until hour seven, they finish with the fastest planet, which is the Moon. Then you run out of planets, and so you have to start over again. And then you go, you know, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, blah, blah, blah. So the last piece of this puzzle that we need to answer the original question of how do the days of the week get into the order that they are is the important mathematical fact that 24 divided by seven is three remainder three. So if we have 24 hours in a day divided by seven planets in the Ptolemaic uh, model of the solar system, then we can go through that whole cycle of planets three times and then wind up with three planets left over at the end. So we can see we go through one, two, three times. And then at the end of the day, for hours 22, 23, and 24, we have to start over again with an incomplete cycle of these planets. So we have Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, and then we end up the next day starting with the sun. Um, so, and then we go through this whole process again. So we went, we have an extra three. So we had Saturn, Jupiter, Mars to the sun, and then we have Venus, Mercury, Moon. And now we're seeing a pattern here. We have day that starts with Saturn, day that starts with sun, day that starts with moon. We have Saturn day, Sunday, Monday. Um, and then we can figure out like, you know, if we assign all of these hours across through the entire week, then we end up with all of the days of the week in the order that we have them now. Um, this is more apparent if you look in a uh, language like Spanish or French, where um, the other days of the week are named things that are closer to the names of the planets. So like Tuesday is Mar uh, Martes in Spanish, like Mars Day. Miércoles is like Mercury Day. Uh, Jueves is like Jupiter Day. Uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, we have gone through a few other uh, 
revisions since then as those uh, original Greek gods got translated into Germanic and Norse gods, and then they got translated into the English language. But it all comes back to these uh, ancient Greek, uh, this ancient Greek system of dividing up all of the hours of the week into their own individual planets. So that was a fun explanation to have to relay back to this person who was just having an argument with her coworkers about how the days of the week got into the order that they were. Um, and that question ended up being way more interesting to me than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, and of course, there are questions that kind of go the other way too. This is a question that I got from some uh, a, a fourth grader who, by way of her teacher, asked me, how has the Milky Way galaxy changed in the past 100 years? This sounds like a great question. Um, and this uh, fourth grader was very excited to ask it. But unfortunately, the answer to this question is, not really much at all. Um, and this kind of brings up another topic that, or another thing that I have to consider while I am answering these questions, which is uh, how do I answer this question in the best, most interesting possible way? Or how do I turn this question into a more interesting version of the question that they asked? So if I were to answer this question literally, then I could say, that the Milky Way gets a tiny fraction of a percent older. It gets a, completes a tiny per, fraction of a percent of its rotation. Uh, it, the black hole at the center grows a tiny amount. We get, we move a tiny amount, blah, blah, blah. All of these things, none of these answers are very interesting. These are not something that a fourth grader would actually appreciate. So how can I reframe these same facts and kind of slight, subtly change the question so that it is uh, more interesting to the person that asked it? So instead of saying that all of these things changed by a tiny fraction, if I put them into uh, you know, more concrete terms, I could say that the solar system moves over 400 billion miles around the galaxy, which is 33,000 times further than the distance to Pluto, which as we saw is a tiny, tiny fraction of the size of the galaxy. But this fourth grader doesn't need to know that. This fourth grader just needs to know that the, the solar system is moving super far because that is going to kind of spur interest in this field. Um, or instead of getting an almost imperceptible amount heavier as a galaxy, we can say that there are 700 new stars that are formed across the galaxy. Um, we can say that there, one giant star will explode in a supernova, as I was talking about before. These, uh, these are rare, but over the course of a century, you can maybe expect one of them in the entire galaxy to, do, to actually explode. Um, and the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy sucks in enough gas to make a whole new Jupiter, which, you know, behind the scenes, that is a, a minuscule fraction of the actual mass of the black hole. But if you put it in terms of something that's more like concrete, more understandable, then it's going to be much more interesting to the person that was asking the question. So I'm kind of constantly thinking in the back of my mind, if somebody asks a question that isn't necessarily going to give them a satisfying answer, um, okay, let me rephrase this in a way that will make you care more about the astronomy that leads to the answer to this question, which is really the point of the uh, uh, whole ask an astronomer email address in the email address in the first place. Um, so there's also just some questions that I get that I don't even really know where to start or really know how to answer. So here's a uh, big email that I got at some point. Hello, my name is redacted and I'm in seventh grade. I don't know how to prove to you that I'm a child, so I really hope you believe me. I've been having anxiety about all sorts of space related things and I'm having anxiety about a gamma ray burst. To be more specific, I'm having anxiety about a gamma ray, gamma ray burst from a star, Wolf Ray 104. Some websites say the star could send a gamma ray burst at Earth, but some say the star, the star is at an angle facing away from the Earth, so the gamma ray burst hitting Earth would be impossible. In conclusion, to help me with my anxiety, I would really, I would like you to tell me if the star will send gamma ray bursts at the Earth, and if not, why? And if the gamma ray bursts are to come to Earth, when do you think they would arrive? Please try to get back to me soon. I'm having a lot of anxiety. So if I, when I read this, I was like, oh boy, okay, I need to tread carefully here in this question. Let's uh, try to talk about this in as soothing of a way as possible, because this kid is clearly uh, having a hard time thinking about these gamma ray bursts. So. To start off, let's talk about what is a Wolf-Rayet star. 
a wolf ray star is a star that looks something like this. It's a super, super gigantic, massive star that is so big that over the course of its life, it is constantly blowing itself apart and throwing off gas and dust into the area surrounding it. So you can see that this star um, has built up this nice looking nebula all the way around it um, that is lit up by the bright light of the star at the center. Um, and like most big stars, at the end of its life, the wolf ray stars will explode in a massive violent supernova. Um, but uh, it is theorized that when these stars explode, not only do they make that explosion, they also make this jet of energy called a gamma ray burst. And this is a uh, massive beam of radiation that is uh, shot out across the universe. And it can be really unfortunate if you are right there in sitting in front of this uh, fire hose full of uh, energy uh, and then your planet is destroyed or something like that. So is this actually a problem? Does our seventh grade friend need to be worried about this happening to the Earth from this star? Well, first, let's consider this actual situation about the star that he was asking about. First, it almost certainly will not happen in your lifetime. These stars are in this stage of looking like they're about to explode for hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. So even if you're in seventh grade, you're probably not going to live long enough for this to actually be a problem in your lifetime. Uh, the second uh, soothing factor of this is that it's probably going to miss. These jets of radiation are only about 10 degrees wide, which means that there's only a tiny chance that you will be exactly staring down the barrel of this star as it explodes. Um, we can't tell which way these stars are pointing at any given time. And so we don't know whether the star is even pointed at us for sure. Um, so it's probably, even if it does explode, it's probably not going to hit us. Um, and furthermore, it would have to actually reach our planet. This star is 7,500 light years away from uh, the Earth, which is a good fraction of the size of the entire galaxy. Um, so it would have to get through all of the space and all of the stuff that is uh, between us and this uh, star without getting messed up or anything. So it's probably not an issue. But I hear the seventh graders anxiety saying, what if it did happen? Um, and the main thing to remember here is that this has happened before. Um, we know that most of the time when Earth gets hit like, with events like this, most of the radiation is deflected by Earth's magnetic field, which acts as a shield for stuff like this. And it, uh, the only thing that we get is maybe some more radiation on the surface of the Earth. This is how geologists have kind of figured out that these kinds of things have happened to the Earth in the past is because they see a slight uptick of the amount of radioactive stuff that they find in uh, rocks every once in a while and they theorize that it comes from these sorts of events. So hopefully if I can give a well thought out calm answer and send this back to a uh, this kid then he can uh, hopefully be less anxious about his uh, fear of gamma ray bursts. So to wrap up I want to uh, give some examples of some more uh, more of the uh, fun off the wall types of questions that I get. Um, these ones I don't even always know how to answer, but they're kind of just uh, fun to look at. So what would you, why would you need to, uh, why do we need to go find and go to other planets? I like Earth and I would like to stay here. This is asked by a middle schooler in Brazil who was afraid that somebody was going to force him to be an astronaut. And so I just had to say, no, don't worry. No one's going to force you. You can just stay home. Um, or uh, please call me as I don't want to say what I think in case it, I could make me rich. My phone number is redacted. So please call me and we can both be rich. Uh, I did call the number. No one picked up. Too bad. I could have been rich, I guess. Um, or will you be on our podcast about conspiracy theories? This is a, a group of friends in North Carolina who had started their own podcast and they needed a scientific expert to uh, answer some of their uh, questions they had from investigating flat earth theorists and uh, all of the random bogus scientific claims that they make. So I got to be on their podcast. Um, 
for uh, how could we use expired satellites in a better way? This by itself is a fair question. I answered him like, you know, there are people trying to kind of do space trash collecting to make sure we don't have a bunch of junk, junk floating around in space. And so I answered about that. Um, and to which he responded, my objective is to use these dead satellites or their parts as a space weapon. I'm like, okay, I better not respond to this guy anymore. I don't, I don't want to be a part of a uh, supervillain origin story or anything like that. Um, or uh, one of my favorite, most inscrutable questions that I've gotten, what do the rings of Saturn represent? I know what they are, but what they represent, I don't know. That's a more uh, hard to answer philosophical question. You might have to ask a poet about that one. So anyways, uh, those are kind of some samples of uh, questions that I get as the Ask an Astronomer. And I'm, I'm now happy to answer any questions that you have, or if you, you can email me anytime at askanastronomer at uclick.org. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, uh, Brian. That was fascinating. Um, and as predicted, we have a vast amount of questions. So <laughs> you can look at the chat yourself. Uh, we had yeah. some Comet Neowise questions, and I think a, a few of us in the audience were able to address some of those. You can, you can address that as well. But there are other interesting ones, and I'll let you take your pick. Yeah, I'll, uh, let me see. I, let me read these. I, I can say a little bit about the, uh, the comet first. So uh, Comet Neowise, as you may have seen in the news in the past few weeks, is a relatively bright comet that uh, is kind of passing by the sun right now, which means that it is bright and has a nice long tail. Um, and this is the first comet in a while that we've been able to see in the northern hemisphere with our naked eye. Um, there, there it is, uh, over Lick Observatory. Yeah, exactly. That's a great uh, picture. Um, so you can see this from the Bay Area, but you have to be very deliberate about where you're looking. Um, so it's up either very early in the morning, right before or before the sun starts to like come up and make the sky too bright. And it's up also uh, at night, just after the sun has gone down. Um, it's kind of hard to find, but I was able to find it a few days ago, actually. I went outside here in Santa Cruz. Um, and it looks like a kind of faint fuzzy blob. And if you get out binoculars, like I have some of my binoculars right here, then you can look at that faint fuzzy blob and usually see a little bit of tail. Um, so I think there are plenty of like, if you Google like how to see Comet Neowise, then you can find a chart that will be helpful for you to figure out where to look. Um, but I will say it's kind of hard to see. The either get up at like, you know, 4.45 in the morning and go look out low in the east or um, not too long after the sun sets, go out and look low in the west. Um, and it should be there for the next, you know, few days or two, a couple weeks. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, da, da, da. What's my favorite constellation? Oh, I like the ones that actually look like what they're supposed to. So I really like Orion because you can tell like, okay, that's a person. That's not just, you know, some Greek person that's uh, making something up that like is actually a guy. Um, what other constellations do I like? Uh, I like Pegasus because there's some cool stuff in Pegasus. I also like Cygnus. There's a lot of cool stuff in Cygnus. Um, what and do you think of Camelopartalus? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a camelopardalus is, so I don't know if it looks like what it's supposed to. Oh, a giraffe. It is really long and squiggly, so I guess that's kind of a, that uh, makes sense. Um, but yeah, one of my favorite constellations, I would say, is Sagittarius, which is uh, where the center of the Milky Way is. And I like that because if you look at it, if you look around Sagittarius with a telescope, um, you know, in the middle of the summer, you can always usually see some cool thing that is off towards the center of the galaxy. Um, all right, if we can see galaxies and telescopes, how come we can't see the flag the astronauts left on the moon? This is a question that gets asked a lot, not to me, but I've seen it a lot of times. Uh, the problem is that, it was, so a lot of times people assume that far away equals small and small equals far away, but that's not always true. Um, if you were to look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is, you know, the, the nearest galaxy to us, and you could actually see all of it in the sky um, with your naked eye, then it would be about 10 times the size of the moon. 
So galaxies are huge. Like that's uh, something that people don't really get their minds around often. Um, so compared to something like the moon or a planet or even the footprints and flags uh, from astronauts on the moon, they're absolutely tiny compared to uh, the galaxies that we can, that are, you know, much, much larger, even though they're much, much further away. Um, what happens to satellites when they die? Do they just float around forever? Uh, it depends. Some satellites, if they're low enough, they're actually still kind of in a little bit of the atmosphere. The atmosphere does never really like stop. There's no just like edge of the atmosphere, it just kind of you know, gets thinner and thinner as it kind of fades away into nothing. So satellites, even if they're like up in what we would consider space, um, they still have some amount of air resistance that they're fighting against. And so eventually, if you don't do anything about that, then your satellite will just fall back to Earth. So most satellites, that is their fate, is eventually they fall back to Earth. Some of them are high enough or they, when they get like, you know, decommissioned by whatever company runs them, they get boosted up high enough that they're just kind of off in the middle of space and they'll never come back and they're just floating around forever. Um, but it, recently there have been efforts to get everybody who's launching satellites now to come up with some plan to dispose of their satellite because we don't want a bunch of, you know, really old satellites junking up all of our orbits. Um, okay, is, is there one organization that tracks the position of all satellites in space debris? Uh, something like a tumbling stage isn't in geosync, how is it even tracked? Um, as far as I know, the main agency that does this is the US Air Force. Uh, they have some powerful radar dishes that they just use to send radar pulses out into the sky and then they can track the, uh, uh, the satellites through the sky just like they can with any airplanes. Um, this of course only works down to a certain size. So they know of a lot of random debris that has e either from satellites or stuff that has fallen off of rockets or stuff like that, that they track, but there's innumerable other smaller things that are up there. Um, so these tumbling stages are kind of well known where they are because they're pretty big. Um, Okay, I've heard that a modern astronomer's work mostly involves analyzing data. Many of them could not point out constellations in the night sky. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, I have talked to people that basically don't ever really go look through a telescope themselves. A lot of people, you know, myself included, spend all of their time just uh, sitting at a computer analyzing code that somebody, or analyzing data that, uh, somebody else took at a telescope, but I myself have never actually been to that telescope. And that doesn't mean that you can't know things about astronomy. I think like, you know, like hobby astronomy is completely separate from professional astronomy, but it doesn't mean that they have to be mutually exclusive. Like, you know, I still know a lot about satellites and constellations and planets and where things are in the sky, but it's absolutely not necessary for my everyday work. Um, what do I think is the best way to avoid space debris forming? Oof, this is a really tough question. Um, so as I was kind of mentioning before, satellites, when they die, most of them just kind of stay up there for a while until they eventually fall back to Earth. What that can take, you know, decades or centuries. Um, and eventually things are just going to get clogged up with junk. So I would say that it, and the other problem is that it takes a lot of energy to go get a satellite. You know, the, all of these satellites are moving at 17,000 miles an hour as they go around the earth. And so you have to get yourself up to 17,000 miles to go catch one and, you know, bring it in. And then if you want to go get another one, then you might have to go 17,000 miles an hour in a different direction. So it's really hard to like efficiently grab a bunch of satellites at uh, the same time. Um, so I would say that maybe the best way to do this would be to use lasers to kind of push on satellites like and make them get to get themselves out of orbit. If you can kind of boil off part of a satellite that will so that it pushes itself kind of out of orbit and back into uh, the atmosphere, then that might work. But you know, this is an open problem. There's no real solution to this. Um, is it true that the universe is expanding outwards at faster than the speed of light? 
If so, how can we measure this and how can we continue to see these expanding galaxies even if they are expanding at such a high rate of speed? So it is true that the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. But uh, what's important to understand is that when we're looking at something, it hasn't always been expanding away from us at faster than the speed of light. Um, we can see that like, you know, if we look at a galaxy that is on the other side of the universe, it, we can tell that it is receding from us at, you know, several times the speed of light. But you can kind of think of the expansion of the universe as like, you know, running on a treadmill. Like it's the light is still moving as quickly as it is, but the treadmill of the expansion of the universe is pushing it backwards. But, you know, eventually it will make it to the place that it's going. Like the expansion of the universe is kind of like a treadmill that is speeding up slowly over time. And so if the light starts early enough, then it can outpace the uh, treadmill and make it to us. But uh, eventually if things get too far away where the light can't outpace the treadmill anymore and we'll never be able to see those uh, objects. Um, why or why not is Pluto a planet? So, okay, this is, I, I know this is a very controversial question, especially considering whether you are uh, in elementary school before or after 2006 when it was decided that it was not a planet. Um, I, the, the reasons that Pluto was deemed to not be a planet is because one, it doesn't ha really have a circular orbit. Pluto spends some of its time, uh, or spends most of its time as being the furthest out planet, but actually for a portion of its uh, orbit, it gets inside of the orbit of Neptune because its orbit is kind of like an oval rather than a circle. So part of the time it's closer to the sun, part of the time it's further away from the sun and all the other things that we call planets, none of them are really that like elliptical in their orbits. So that's a problem. Um, another factor is that it uh, is not like really dominant in its orbit. Like Pluto has a big moon called Charon that is, or Charon, or Sharon, or I don't know what you want, how you want to pronounce your Greek, um, that is very large compared to Pluto. And it's much larger in comparison to Pluto than any other planet moon pair in the rest of the solar system. And so you would expect for that something like a planet should be able to kind of clear its area of all of the other big stuff that is around it. And so if it couldn't do that, then maybe it's not a planet. Um, but the other, like the main factor is if we call Pluto a planet, then logically we kind of have to call a whole bunch of other stuff a planet. There's a bunch of stuff kind of out in the outer solar system and even asteroids in the asteroid belt that tick all of the same boxes as Pluto does, but we just never ended up calling them planets. Um, so if we call Pluto a planet, then we would have to have like 15 planets because that's how many things there that are kind of on the same level as Pluto. Um, so anyways, it's a touchy subject. I'm not going to think less of you if you still like to think of Pluto as a planet, um, but it's kind of in a class below all the rest of the planets. I guess Brian, um, we can we can wrap up with the last question, which a couple of them are both on the same subject, which is your field of study and your PhD thesis in uh -huh. gravitational lensing. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So my uh, field of study. So there's this concept called gravitational lensing which is the idea that heavy stuff bends light. Um, and this is something that was for an idea that was first put forward by Albert Einstein and his theory of general relativity that like, you know, gravity warps space time. And as light is traveling through these warps, it will get bent itself. And so if you are looking at something and you can see that its light has been warped, then you can use that as kind of a scale to weigh whatever is doing the warping. Um, so if I am looking at a galaxy cluster and I'm looking at some galaxy that's behind this galaxy cluster and I see that it's kind of gotten its shape distorted by this uh, gravitational lensing, then if I can quantify how much it has been distorted, then I can tell how heavy this galaxy cluster is, which is very valuable because uh, it's hard to weigh galaxy clusters because there's a lot of uh, stuff like dark matter, which somebody asked, uh, does dark matter emit any radiation? It doesn't, we can't see it. Um, so it's really hard to figure out how much it weighs. 
Um, but if we can find these distortions, then that's helpful. So what I'm doing for my PhD is looking at gravitational lensing in a new way. I'm looking at kind of how the galaxies are rotating to see if I can better understand how much they are being warped because it kind of through a lot of math and, you know, geometry and everything leads to a uh, it, looking at how the velocity of the galaxy as it's rotating is, has been changed. You can tell how much it's being changed, how much it uh, has been warped by the gravitational lensing. So that's what I'm working on. Um, I have some code running in the background right now that is uh, fitting these galaxies and figuring out how they're rotating. And uh, so that's what I'm working on. So when do you plan on defending your dissertation? <laughs> so I'm about halfway through my PhD. I'm three years in now, going into my fourth year. And usually people take five to six years to go from uh, the end of college to the end of your PhD. I got a master's degree along the way, but that's kind of just a speed bump in the uh, world of astronomy. It's PhD or bust, essentially. <laughs> well, that's fascinating, Brian. I want to thank you for coming and sharing with us your insights on being the UC astronomer of records so that people can ask the astronomer and you can, I think, just Google ask an astronomer and yeah. you get the UC page. Yeah, I should have mentioned that we're number like somewhere between four and six on the uh, ask an astronomer Google search. So if you do that, then you can uh, uh, find us or you can, it's ask an astronomer at uculic.org. So ask me questions anytime. I'm sh I'll be try my best to answer them. Yes, you now have a whole flock of new people who are going to flood you with some more questions on your site. So. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank you for coming. And those of you who are out in the audience, you can show your appreciation if you want to uh, with a virtual hand clap, or you can go down on the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says reactions, and you can actually pick a hand and start clapping. There you go. So thank you for that, Brian DiGiorgio. We really appreciate it. Thanks. And everybody, Thanks for having me. Oh, you're, uh, it, it was great to have you. We're going to gather here again two weeks from today uh, on Wednesday the 29th to hear the talk by J.R. Williams on the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen. And until that time, please stay safe and uh, have a great evening. And we'll see you back here at Pillar Hangar Talk. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Roger. <laughs> That's my brother. <laughs> and thank you, Brian. Well done. Good yeah. job. I'll pull yeah, the plug thanks. on it right here. <laughs> all right. Thanks, thanks for everybody. Putting it all together. <laughs>